You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of... Uh, a Collected Works, Volume 178, by Rudolf Steiner. These are the appended lectures. Uh, this is lecture, shall we say, 8, even though it's not in the book. It's in the original German book, um, on secret brotherhoods. And this one is on psychoanalysis and uh, anthroposophy. Through the lectures I am giving now in Zurich, I am freshly reminded that one can hardly encounter the spiritual life of that city without giving some attention to what is now called analytical psychology or psychoanalysis. Various reflections connected with this realization prompt me to introduce what I have to say today with a short discussion of certain points in analytical psychology or psychoanalysis that we will then link with my further remarks. We have often noted how important it is for researchers in the field of anthroposophical spiritual science to connect their studies with what our own age offers. It may be said that all sorts of people who feel drawn to psychoanalysis are earnestly searching for the spiritual foundations of existence, for the inner realities of the human soul. And it is a curious characteristic of our time that so many of our contemporaries are becoming aware of certain peculiar forces in the human soul. The psychoanalysts belong to those who, simply through the impulses of the age, are forced to look at certain phenomena of soul. It is especially important not to remain entirely oblivious of this movement, because the phenomena it takes into consideration are really present and in our time they intrude themselves for various reasons upon our attention. Today we must become aware of such phenomena. On the other hand, the people who concern themselves with these things lack the means of knowledge required to discuss and, above all, to understand them. Thus we may say that psychoanalysis is a phenomenon of our time that compels people to take note of certain soul processes, and yet it leads them to study these processes with inadequate means. It is particularly significant that here the investigation of something that obviously exists and challenges our understanding is based on inadequate methods of knowledge, and that, and that always leads to various serious errors. It can be hazardous to social life and to the further development of knowledge, as well as to the latter's influence on social life. It may be said that half-truths are, under certain circumstances, more harmful than complete errors. And what the psychoanalysts bring to light today can be regarded only as an assortment of quarter-truths, let us consider a few excerpts from the research journal of the psychoanalysts. What is called psychoanalysis today began with a medical case studied by a Vienna intern, a Dr. Breuer, in the 1880s. Dr. Breuer, a physician with whom I was acquainted, had an extraordinarily subtle mind. He was greatly interested in all sorts of aesthetic and general human problems. As he was very thorough and careful in dealing with his patients, it was natural that one of his cases in particular was especially interesting to him. He had to treat a woman who seemed to be suffering from severe symptoms of hysteria. Her symptoms were a paralysis of one arm, occasional fits of absent-mindedness or twilight states, deep drowsiness, and in addition she had forgotten her native language. She had always been able to speak German, it was her mother tongue, but under the influence of her hysteria she could no longer do so. She could speak and understand only English. Boyer noticed that during her twilight states he could persuade her through careful medical treatment to speak of a certain scene, a very trying past experience. Now I will show you from the description of the case given by the Breuer school how the woman in her absent-minded condition 
which was sometimes artificially induced, Breuer could easily hypnotize a patient, was induced to speak of these experiences. What she said gave the impression that her hysteria was connected with her father's illness, through which she had nursed him a long time ago. Her father had been very ill, and she had been helping with the nursing when she had the experience. She spoke again and again of this particular experience, which is described as follows, quote, One night, watching by the sick man who had a high fever, she was tense with anxiety because a surgeon was expected from Vienna to perform an operation. Her mother had left the room for a while, and Anna, the patient, sat by the sick bed with her right arm hanging over the back of the chair. She fell into a sort of waking dream, in which she saw a black snake coming, apparently out of the wall, toward the sick man, as though to bite him. Close quote. Nowadays, people usually get a blow on the back of the neck by materialism, and so we find in this report the following comment, which we do not need to set great store by. Quote, it is quite likely that there really were snakes in the meadow at the back of the house, which had already given the girl a fright, and which now provided the material for the hallucination. Close quote. That is only an incidental remark. You may attach importance to it or not, it does not matter. As the patient saw it, the snake came out of the wall to bite her father. Quote, she wanted to drive the creature away, but she felt paralyzed. Her right arm hanging over the back of the chair had, quote, gone to sleep, close quote. It had become anesthetic and paretic, and as she looked at it, the fingers changed into little serpents with death's heads. Probably she made efforts to drive away the snake with her paralyzed right hand, so that the anesthesia and paralysis became associated with the snake hallucination. When the snake had disappeared, she was so frightened that she wanted to pray, but all speech failed her. She could not utter a word, till finally she remembered an English nursery rhyme, and then she was able to go on thinking and praying in English. Close quote. The whole illness originated from this experience. From it there had remained the paralysis of one hand, twilight states of various kinds, and the inability to express herself in any language but English. Breuer then noticed that the condition was alleviated whenever he had her tell her story, and he based his treatment upon this fact. Through hypnosis he drew from her little by little all the details and really succeeded in bringing about a marked improvement in her condition. The patient got rid of the problem, as it were, by expressing and communicating it to another person. Breuer and his collaborator Freud in Vienna were both influenced, as was natural at that time, by the school of Charcot in Paris and diagnosed this case as a psychic trauma, a psychic wound, what is called in England a nervous shock. The psychic shock was supposed to have been this experience at her father's bedside and to have had an effect upon the soul similar to that of a physical wound upon the body. It must be noted that from the beginning Boyer saw the whole affair as a soul illness, as a matter of the inner life. He was convinced from the beginning that no anatomical or physiological changes could have been shown, for example, no changes in the nerves leading from the arm to the brain. He was convinced from the start that he was dealing with a psychic symptom. In those early days, researchers were inclined to regard these cases as induced by wounds in the, of the soul, shocks and the like. Very soon, however, because of Dr. Freud's active interest, theories took on a different character. Boyer was never fully in accord with Freud's further development of the subject. Freud felt that the theory of soul wounds did not fully explain these cases. Boyer also was convinced that simply attributing these illnesses to a wound of the soul was not enough. I would like to point out parenthetically, as it were, that Dr. Breuer was a very busy practicing physician, thoroughly trained in science, an excellent student of Notnagel, and it was not only because of external circumstances that he never became a professor. We may well believe that if Breuer, instead of remaining one of the busiest physicians in Vienna with little time for scientific research, had obtained a professorship and had thus been able to follow up this problem, it might have taken on a very different form. <laughs>
But from then on, Dr. Freud took a special interest in the matter. He realized that the theory of trauma does not explain these cases. It needs to be determined under what conditions such a soul wound affects the patient. After all, it might be said with justice that many people had sat at sick beds and certainly had equally deep impressions, but without leading to the same results. The unschooled layperson settles such problems promptly with the extraordinarily profound explanation that one person is predisposed to such symptoms while another is not. Although very profound, in quotes, this is the most absurd solution one can arrive at, is it not? For if you can explain things on the basis of predisposition, you can easily explain everything in the world. All you need to say is that the predisposition for a certain thing exists. Of course, serious thinkers did not concern themselves with such ideas, but sought the real conditions. And Freud believed he had discovered them in cases such as the following. You will find innumerable similar cases in the literature of the psychoanalysts today, and it may be admitted that an immense amount of material has been collected in order to decide this or that point in this field. I will describe this one case, making it as comprehensible as possible. Its absolute historical accuracy is not important to us. There was a woman with other guests at an evening party, a farewell party for the mistress of the house, who suffered from nervousness and was about to leave for a health resort abroad. She was to leave that evening. After the party had broken up and the hostess had departed, the woman whose case we are describing was walking with other guests along the street when a cab came around the corner behind them, not an automobile but a cab with horses driven at a great pace. In smaller cities, people returning home at night often walk in the middle of the street instead of on the sidewalk. I do not know if you have noticed this. As the cab rushed toward them, the guests scattered to the right and left and onto the sidewalks, with the exception of this one woman we are considering. She ran along the street in front of the horses, and all the drivers cursing and swearing and cracking of his whip could not make her move aside. She ran until she came to a bridge where she tried to throw herself into the water in order to avoid being run over. She was rescued by people on the bridge and returned to her party, being thus preserved from a serious accident. This behavior was, of course, connected with the woman's general condition. It is undoubtedly due to hysteria when a person runs in the middle of the street in front of horses, and the cause of such behavior had to be discovered. In this and other cases, Freud began by looking for some of the case causes in the patient's past, in childhood or earlier life in general. If something had happened to the patient in the past that had not been completely assimilated by the soul, the event could leave behind an impulse to a certain behavior that could then be triggered later by any shocking experience. And indeed, such an experience was found in the childhood of the woman in question. As a child, she had been taken for a ride in a carriage and the horses became frightened and ran away straight toward the river. The coachman jumped off and called to the girl to do the same. She jumped down at the last minute, just before horses and carriage plunged into the river. Then the later shocking incident occurred and a certain association of horse with horse was there also. (laughs) At the moment when she realized the danger from the horses, She lost control of herself and ran frantically in front of them instead of turning aside, all this as an after-effect of the childhood experience. You see that the psychoanalysts have a scientific method, at least according to present-day scientific ideas. But there are, of course, many people who have had some such experience in childhood without such a reaction. They would not run in front of the horses even if they associated them with horses from their past. To this one event, something had to be added to lead to a, quote, predisposition, close quote, to run in front of the horses instead of stepping out of their way. Freud continued his investigation and actually found an interesting connection in this case. The woman who had run in front of the horses was engaged to be married, but was in love with two men at the same time. 
One was her fiancé, whom she was sure she loved best, but she also loved the other. So she was not quite clear about the matter, only halfway so. She also loved the other man, who was the husband of her best friend, the very friend whose farewell party had taken place that evening. The hostess, who had begun to suffer from nervousness, made her departure, and this woman left with the other guests, ran in front of the horses, was rescued, and was, naturally, brought back into the house she had just left. Further inquiry revealed that in the past there had existed a significant association between this lady and the husband of her best friend. The love affair had already taken on, quote, certain dimensions, close quote, let us say, which accounted for the nervousness of her friend, as you can easily imagine. The physician brought her to this point in the story, but had difficulty in persuading her to continue. She admitted at last that when she came to herself in her friend's house and was again normal, the husband declared his love to her. Quite a remarkable case, as you see. Dr. Freud uh, researched other similar cases, and his findings convinced him that the hysterical symptoms, which had been attributed to a psychic trauma or wound, were due to love whether conscious or unconscious. Freud believed that research into the patient's past, regardless of circumstances, would always reveal that love was playing its game in some way. Of course, these love stories have not necessarily risen into the patient's consciousness. Indeed, in the most characteristic cases, they have not. So Freud completed what he called his neurosis theory or sexual theory. He considered that sexuality entered into all such cases. But such things are extraordinarily tempting and tricky. First of all, in our time, we find everywhere an inclination to call on sex to explain any human problem. Thus, it is not surprising that a doctor who found it to be a factor in so many cases of hysteria sets up such a theory. On the other hand, this is the point where the greatest danger lies because analytical psychology is carrying on research with inadequate tools. The matter is dangerous, first of all, because this longing for knowledge is so extremely tempting. Tempting because of current circumstances and because it may always be proved that sexual relationships play a a role. Yet the psychoanalyst Jung of Zurich, who wrote Über die Psychologie des Unbewussten on the psychology of the unconscious, does not share the opinion that Freud's sexual theory or neurosis theory is sufficient to explain such cases. He has another theory. Jung noted that Freud had has opponents. Among them is a certain Adler, who takes a quite different viewpoint. Freud examined numerous cases and found that the sexual factor played a role in each of them and therefore settled upon sex as the original cause. You can read it all in Jung's book. (laughs) But Adler approached the problem from another perspective and decided that it was more important than the one Freud placed in the foreground. Adler, I will put it only in general terms, found that there was another drive that played as important a role in the human being as the sexual one, namely the drive for power, power over one's environment, or power in general. According to Nietzsche, the will to power is supposedly a philosophical principle. And one can find as many cases to support the theory of the hunger for power as Freud found for his sexual theory. One need only analyze patients suffering from hysteria. They are not at all rare. For example, imagine a woman is hysterical and has spasms. Heart spasms are a favorite in such cases as well as all sorts of other conditions. Her family and the whole household are stirred up, everything possible is done, doctors are summoned, and the patient is greatly pitied. In short, she exercises a tyrannical power over her environment. A reasonable person knows that there is usually nothing really wrong with the patient, even though she feels she is sick and suffers from it. Such patients are in reality perfectly healthy, but ill when they wish to be. You can diagnose them as both healthy and sick at the same time. Of course, they fall down when they faint in a heart spasm, but as a rule they fall on the rug, not on the bare floor. These things can be observed. Now, this unconscious drive for power leads very easily to hysterical conditions. 
Adler examined the cases at his disposal for this drive for power and found that everywhere the hysterical symptoms appeared because the lust for power had somehow been aroused and distorted into pathological extremes. Jung said to himself, Oh, well, one cannot say Freud is wrong, what he observed is there, and one cannot say Adler is wrong, what he observed is also there. So it is probably sometimes one way and sometimes the other. That is quite reasonable. But it is indeed sometimes one way and sometimes the other, but Jung built a special theory upon this. Jung's theory is not uninteresting if you do not take it abstractly, simply as a theory, but instead can see the impulses of our time at work in it, especially the feebleness of understanding in our age and its inadequacy. Jung says, There are two types of people. In one type, feeling is more developed. In the other, thinking. Here again, a great scholar made a, quote, epoch-making, close quote, discovery which actually every reasonable person can always easily make right in his or her immediate environment. After all, it is obvious that human beings can be divided into thinking people and feeling people. But erudition has a different task. It must not regard things as lay people would and simply say that there are two types of people, feeling people and rationalists. Erudition or scholarship must add something. And it says in this case that the one who feels his way into things sends out his own force into the object. The other draws back from the object, or halts before it and reflects on it. The first is called the, quote, extrovert, quote, unquote, type, and the other the, quote, introvert, close quote. The first would be the feeling person, the second the rationalist. These are scholarly categories, are they not? Ingenious, brilliant, really descriptive, at least up to a point. That is not to be denied. Then Jung goes on to say, in the case of the extrovert, that is, of the person who prefers to live in his or her feelings, the intellectual concepts very frequently remain stuck in the subconscious mind. Thus these people find themselves in a conflict between what is in their consciousness and the intellectual concepts teeming in their subconscious. And this conflict can lead to all kinds of conditions, characteristic primarily of people of this type. In the case of people in whom the mind predominates, the rationalists, the feelings remain down below, swarm in the subconscious and come into collision with the conscious life, which cannot understand what is surging up, namely the subconscious feelings. Because human beings are never finished and complete, but are sometimes this type and sometimes the other, Circumstances may come about causing the subconscious mind to revolt against the conscious, and this can often lead to hysterical conditions. Now we can say that Jung's theory is simply a paraphrase of the banal and trite division of people into feeling and rational types, without adding anything to the facts. However, from all this you must realize that people of our time are at least beginning to notice all sorts of psychic peculiarities and to ask what goes on within a person showing such symptoms. And they have at least advanced far enough to realize that these symptoms are not due to physiological or anatomical changes. People have already outgrown mere materialism in that they speak of psychic phenomena. So this is one way people try to emerge from materialism and to reach some knowledge of the soul. However, when we look at the subject more closely, you will see that people are led onto strange paths because the means they use to try to gain knowledge are so inadequate. But I must emphasize that these people do not realize onto what paths they are driven, and their supporters, readers, and contemporaries do not see it either. Thus rightly seen, the whole thing is actually a very dangerous side, because so much is not taken into consideration, but instead rumbles around in people's subconscious. Strangely enough, it is the theories themselves that cause a commotion in people's subconscious. The researchers set up a theory about the subconscious, and with this they themselves agitate the subconscious. <clears throat> Jung approaches the matter as a physician, and it is important that patients are treated psychologically and therapeutically from that standpoint. Many people are striving to introduce this matter into pedagogy and to apply it there, 
Thus we are no longer dealing merely with a limited theory, but with an effort to make it into a cultural influence. It is interesting to see how someone like Jung, who approaches this matter as a physician and has studied, treated, and apparently even cured all sorts of cases, is driven further and further. According to him, when such abnormal psychological symptoms are found, one must search to discover any incidents in childhood that made an impression on the person's soul life and produced after effects. That is something especially sought for in this field after-effects of something that happened in childhood. I have mentioned an example that plays such a role in the literature of psychoanalysis. Then Jung found that in many cases of genuine illness, one cannot prove that the patient as an individual is suffering from any such after-effects, no matter how far back into earliest childhood one goes. If you take into consideration everything the patient has come in contact with, you find the conflict within the individual, but no explanation of its cause. So Jung was led to distinguish two kinds of unconscious. First, the individual unconscious existing in each person, but of course not on a conscious level. Thus, if the young woman in her childhood jumped out of a carriage and received a shock, the incident has long since vanished from her conscious mind and works only subconsciously. If you consider this unconscious element, made up of innumerable details, you get the personal or individual unconscious. This is the first type Jung distinguished. But the second is the supra-personal or collective unconscious. According to Jung, there are things affecting the soul life that are neither in the individual personality nor in the outside world and therefore must be assumed to exist in a soul world. The aim of psychoanalysis is to bring such soul contents into consciousness. That is supposed to be the healing method, to bring everything into consciousness. Thus the physician must try to extract from the patients not only what they have experienced individually, but also what was neither an individual experience nor in the outside world, but is contained... Let me read that again, there's a typo. Thus the physician must try to extract from the patients not only what they have experienced individually, but also what was neither an individual experience nor in the outside world, but is contained in the soul. This led psychoanalysts to say that an individual experience is not only what he or she goes through after physical birth, but also all sorts of things from before birth, and all this then rumbles around inside the person. Thus, People born today experience the Oedipus saga on a subconscious level. They do not just learn about it in school, but, in quotes, experience it. They experience the Greek gods, the whole past of humanity. However, unfortunately, these experiences want to come up into the conscious mind. Psychoanalysts must therefore say, and they do indeed go as far as that, that the children in ancient Greece also experienced this, but since they were told about it, they could experience it consciously. We, nowadays, also experience it, but it only rumbles around within us, in extroverts, in the subconscious thoughts, and in introverts, in the subconscious feelings. These experiences simmer within people and rumble around in them like demons. Now consider the necessity that confronts the psychoanalysts if they want to be true to their theory. They want necessarily to have to take these things seriously and say simply that if people may be made ill while growing up by their relationship to what simmers within them, a relationship of which they know nothing, then this must be brought to their consciousness. It must be explained to the patients that there is a spiritual world inhabited by different gods. After all, even psychoanalysts will admit that the human soul has a connection to the gods, but they think the fact that the soul knows nothing of this connection, causes illness. In their search for information and knowledge, psychoanalysts resort to all kinds of expedients, some of them quite grotesque. Let us assume a patient, suffering from hysteria, needs to be treated for this or that symptom caused by fear of a demon, a fire demon, let's say. In the past, people believed in fire demons. They had visions of them and knew about them. 
Nowadays, people still have connections with them, as psychoanalysts will admit, but these connections are not conscious. In addition, no one explains that there are fire demons, so these unconscious relationships become a cause of illness. Jung even goes so far as to assert that the gods with whom we are connected, without knowing it, will become angry and avenge themselves. Their revenge shows up as hysteria. Very well, it amounts to this. In our time, individuals who are tormented in their subconscious mind by a demon do not know that there are demons in fire. A fire demon torments them. Yet they cannot establish a relationship with him because that would be superstition. What do these poor modern people do when they become ill from all this? They project the matter into the outer world. That is, they look up some friend they had liked quite well and say, This is the one who persecutes me and gripes about me. They feel persecuted, which means, in fact, that they have a demon tormenting them, but they have transferred it to another person. In treating such a case, psychoanalysts often divert this transference upon themselves. Thus it often happens that patients make their doctor, for better or worse, into a god or a devil. So you see, Modern doctors perforce have to admit that people are tormented by spirits, but as they are taught nothing about such spirits, people cannot take possession of them in their conscious minds. As a result, they pester and plague each other, projecting their demons onto each other, talking each other into all kinds of demoniacal nonsense, and so on. And how disastrous psychoanalysts think this is, can be seen from the following case Jung describes. He says that some of his colleagues claim that the soul energies resulting from such torment must be guided into other channels. Let us return then to one of the elementary cases of psychoanalysis. A female patient seeks treatment. Her illness was caused, according to her psychoanalytical confession, by her having been in love many years ago with a man who rejected her. This had remained with her. Of course, maybe she is plagued by a demon, but in most cases, coming to doctors' attention, it turns out that something happened in the individual consciousness which they distinguish from the collective unconscious. Excuse me, something happened in the individual unconscious which they distinguish from the collective unconscious. They try to redirect this immature fantasy or to transform it. If a love-starved soul can be persuaded to pour her unrequited love into humanitarian services, perhaps organizing this or that benefit, things may turn out well. But Jung himself says that it is not always possible to direct the energy in this way. Energies created in the soul in this way have a certain gradient that cannot be altered. Well, I have nothing against these expressions, yet I would like to point out that they only circumscribe what lay people often say in their own words. Jung describes a very interesting case that shows clearly that this gradient cannot be changed. An American, a typical modern man, a self-made man, the efficient head of a business he had built up, had devoted himself to his work and achieved great success and wealth. Then he thought, I will soon be forty-five, and have done my bit. Now I'll give myself a rest. So he decided to retire, bought an estate with cars and tennis courts and everything else that goes with it. He intended to live in the country and simply to draw his percentage of the business profits. But when he had been on the estate for a while, he stopped playing tennis or driving his car or going to the theater. He no longer took pleasure in the gardens that were laid out, but sat in his room alone and brooded. He was hurting here and there. He had pain everywhere. First his head hurt, then his chest, and then his legs. He could not stand himself and no longer laughed, but instead was tired, weary, and always had a headache. It was terrible. The doctors could not diagnose any illness in the man. That happens with many people nowadays, does it not? They are perfectly healthy, and yet they are ill. Thus the doctor could only say that the man's trouble was psychic. He had adapted himself to the conditions in his business, and his energies would not readily adjust to another course. They follow their own gradient, which cannot be changed. So the doctor recommended the man go back to business. The man in question understood the doctor's advice and followed it. However, he found that he was no longer any good at business, 
He was just as ill there as at home. From this, Jung rightly concludes that you cannot easily transfer energy from one gradient to another, nor even turn it back again when you have failed in the attempt to redirect it. This man eventually came to him for treatment, but Jung could not help the American. It was already too late. The illness had spread too far and should have been treated earlier. You see from this that the therapy with transference is not without problems and difficulties, and Jung himself offers this example. Everywhere we find important facts that can only be successfully dealt with, as I can now say, by spiritual science or anthroposophy. These facts exist and people notice them. The questions are there. It will be discovered that human beings are complicated and not the simple creatures presented to us by 19th century science. Nowadays, psychoanalysts are confronted by a peculiar fact that is completely inexplicable for modern science. Through anthroposophy, with the means provided in my lectures, you will easily find an explanation. Of course, I can come back to the point at issue if you do not find the explanation by yourself. For example, it can happen that someone becomes blind due to hysteria. The blindness, then, is a symptom of hysteria. There are indeed such blind people who are physically able to see, yet do not. They are psychically blind. Now, they are sometimes partially cured, that is, they begin to see again, but they do not see everything. In some cases, the psychically blind person, excuse me, psychically blind people, have recovered sufficient sight to see others, except that they do not see other people's heads. Such half-cured persons thus walk in the streets and see other people without heads. That can really happen. Indeed, there are even more curious things. All this can be dealt with through anthroposophically oriented spiritual science, and in the lecture I gave here last year, you can find the explanation for this inability to see the heads of other people. Well, present-day psychoanalysts are confronted with all these symptoms, and they have seen enough to realize that it can be disastrous for people to have a relationship to the supra-personal unconscious. But, for God's sake, well... Psychoanalysts do not say, for God's sake, but perhaps for science's sake, let us not take the spiritual world seriously. It does not enter their minds to take the spiritual world seriously, and this leads to something very peculiar. Few people notice the strange phenomena that appear as a result of these things. In, I want to point out a passage in Jung's recently published book on the psychology of the unconscious, that will show you how far psychoanalysts are going nowadays. I will have to read you that passage. Jung here presents examples showing that we have within us not only what is in our individual life or in the present, but also primordial connections to all sorts of demonic, divine, or spiritual forces, and so on. Quote, Having shown in this example how new ideas arise out of the treasure house of primordial images, parenthesis here by Steiner. Here Jung does not call them gods, but primordial images, end of aside. Continue, quote, We will proceed to the further discussion of the transference process. We saw that the libido had, for its new object, seized upon those seemingly absurd and singular fantasies, the contents of the collective unconscious. Steiner's aside, the collective unconscious is the suprapersonal unconscious, not the personal, end of aside, continue, quote, as I have already said, the projection of primordial images upon the doctor is a danger not to be underrated at this stage of the treatment. Steiner aside, the patient projects his or her demons onto the doctor. That is a danger. End of Steiner's aside. Continue, quote, The images contain not only all the fine and good things that humanity has ever thought and felt, but the worst infamies and devilries of which men have been capable. End of quote. Just think... Jung has reached the point of understanding that human beings have, unconsciously within them, all the most fiendish crimes as well as the most beautiful things that humanity has ever been able to think and feel. These people cannot be persuaded to speak of Lucifer and Araman, but they agree upon a statement like this, quote, The images contain not only all the fine and good things that humanity has ever thought and felt, but the worst infamies and devilries of which men have been capable. Now, if the patient is unable to distinguish the personality of the doctor from these projections, 
all hope of an understanding is finally lost and a human relationship becomes impossible. But if the patient avoids this charybdis, he is wrecked on the scylla of introjecting these images. In other words, he ascribes their peculiarities not to the doctor but to himself, Steiner aside. Then the patient is the devil, end of the side. This is just as disastrous. In projection, he vacillates, this is still, Ste- this is still Jung, in projection, he vacillates between an extravagant and pathological deification of the doctor and a contempt bristling with hatred. In introjection, he gets involved in a ridiculous self-deification or else a moral self-laceration. The mistake he makes in both cases comes from attributing to a person the contents of the collective unconscious. In this way, he makes himself or his partner either God or devil. This is the reason why men have always needed demons and cannot live without gods, except for a few particularly clever specimens of Homo Occidentalis, who lived yesterday or the day before, supermen whose god is dead, because they themselves have become gods, but tin gods with thick skulls and cold hearts. End of quote. You see, psychoanalysts arrive necessarily at the conclusion that the human soul is so constituted that it needs gods, that gods are necessary to it, for the soul becomes ill without them. Therefore the soul has always had gods. Human beings need gods. Psychoanalysts even mock people by saying that when we lack gods, we make gods of ourselves, but only, quote, tin gods with thick skulls and cold hearts, close quote. They go on to say, quote, the idea of God is an absolutely necessary psychological function of an irrational nature, close quote. To describe the necessity of the concept of God like this in a scientific way is as far as one can go. Human beings must have God. They need Him, as psychoanalysts know. But that sentence does not end there. Let me read you how it ends. Quote, the idea of God is an absolutely necessary psychological function of an irrational nature, which has nothing whatever to do with the question of God's existence. Close quote. When you read the complete sentence, you come upon the great dilemma of our time. Psychoanalysts can prove to you that people become ill if they have no God, but they claim this need for God has nothing to do with the existence or non-existence of God. And Jung continues, quote, For this question, aside whether God exists, is one of the most stupid questions one can pose. Our intellect has long known that we can form no proper idea of God, much less picture to ourselves in what manner he really exists, if at all. Close quote. Now I ask you, are we not at a point here where we can see things very clearly? These people are there, knocking on the doors of knowledge. People who are seeking are also there. They admit an absolute necessity, but when that necessity is posed as a serious question, they consider it one of the stupidest that can be asked. You see, you have here one of the points in present-day cultural life where you can see exactly what is usually ignored. I can assure you that in terms of their knowledge and study of the soul, these psychoanalysts are far ahead of what psychiatry and psychology currently offer in the universities. Indeed, in a certain sense, they are right to look down upon those dreadful so-called sciences, but one can catch them in such a passage that shows what humanity is actually confronted with in contemporary science. Many people are not aware of this. They do not realize how strong trust in authority is nowadays. There has never been trust in authority, nor has it ever been so completely unconscious as it is today. One cannot help but asking again and again just what therapists do to treat cases of hysteria. They look for a content in the subconscious mind that has not been resolved in the person's conscious. Yes, but you find plenty of such unconscious material in the theorists themselves. When you lift it into full consciousness, it turns out to be exactly what you are becoming conscious of right now and what has been simmering in the unconscious of modern doctors and their patients. And all our literature is so saturated with this unconscious content that you are daily and hourly exposed to the danger of absorbing it. And since it is only through spiritual science that people can become aware of these things, many take in such material unknowingly and absorb it into their unconscious where it then remains. At least, 
Psychoanalysts have made us aware that the reality of the soul is to be accepted as such. They have done that, but the devil is at their heels. By that I mean that they are neither able nor willing to approach spiritual reality. Therefore we find everywhere the most incredible statements. The people in our time do not pay enough attention to perceive these things. We naturally expect any reader of Jung's book to fall off his chair at such sentences, but people of our time do not do that. Just think how much must be in the unconscious of modern humanity. And because psychoanalysts see how much there is in the unconscious, and this they do see, they see many things differently than other people. In the preface to his book, for example, Jung says something that is, at least in part, not bad. Close qu- uh, quote. The psychological accompaniments of the present war, above all the incredible brutalization of common judgments, the mutual slanderings, the unprecedented fury of destruction, the unheard of lying, and the inability of men to call a halt to the bloody demon, are uniquely fitted to force upon the attention of every thinking person the problem of the chaotic unconscious, which slumbers uneasily beneath the ordered world of consciousness. This war has pitilessly revealed to civilized man that he is still a barbarian, and has at the same time shown what an iron scourge lies in store for him, if ever again he should be tempted to make his neighbors responsible for his own evil qualities. The psychology of the individual is reflected in the psychology of the nation. Close quote. And now comes a sentence that makes you wonder what to do with it. Quote, what the nation does is done only by each individual, and so long as the individual continues to do it, the nation will do likewise. Only a change in the attitude of the individual can initiate a change in the psychology of the nation. Close quote. These sentences, placed side by side, clearly have a destructive effect on thinking. I would like to ask you if it makes any sense to say, quote, what the nation does is done also by each individual, close quote. If it did, it would also have to be reasonable to ask, could each individual do it without the nations doing it too? It is nonsense, is it not, to say things like that. And it is such nonsense that seems to impress and overwhelm even great and prominent thinkers these days. And this sort of thinking is not only to become therapy, but to provide guidelines for pedagogy. This again is founded upon the justifiable longing to introduce into pedagogy a new soul and spiritual element. However, should conclusions be introduced into pedagogy that were reached with entirely inadequate methods? These are the important questions of our time. We will return to the matter from the standpoint of anthroposophical orientation and illuminate it from a larger perspective. Then we will see that to do justice to these things at all, we must grasp them in a much larger context. But they must also be dealt with concretely. Above all, these problems, which are still being investigated only with the old inadequate methods, must be placed in the light of anthroposophical knowledge. Take, for example, the problem of Nietzsche. Today I can only outline it. Tomorrow we can consider such problems more thoroughly. As we know already from earlier lectures, from 1841 to 1879 there was the battle of spirits above. From 1879 on we have the fallen spirits in the human realm. In future such things and others like them must of necessity play a role in studying a human life. Nietzsche was born in 1844. For three years before he descended to earth, his soul was in the spiritual realm, in the midst of the spiritual battle. During his boyhood, Schopenhauer was still living, but died in 1860. Only after Schopenhauer's death did Nietzsche devote himself to the study of his writings. The soul of Schopenhauer cooperated from the spiritual worlds above. That was the real relationship. Nietzsche was reading Schopenhauer, and, while he was absorbing the latter's writings, Schopenhauer was working upon Nietzsche's thoughts. What was Schopenhauer's situation in the spiritual realm? From 1860 on, through the years when Nietzsche was reading his books, Schopenhauer was in the midst of the spiritual battle that was still being fought on that plane. Therefore, Schopenhauer's inspiration of Nietzsche was colored by what he had gathered from the battle of spirits in which he was involved. 
In 1879, these spirits were cast down from heaven onto the earth. Up to 1879, Nietzsche's spiritual development followed very curious paths. They will be explained in the future as resulting from the influence of Schopenhauer and Wagner. In my book titled Friedrich Nietzsche, A Fight of Freedom, you can find many indications supporting this. Up to that time, Wagner had had no particular influence except that he was active on earth. Wagner was born in 1813, the Battle of the Spirits only began in 1841, but Wagner died in 1883, and Nietzsche's spiritual development took a peculiar turn when Wagner's influence began. Wagner entered the spiritual world in 1883, when the Battle of Spirits was already over, and the defeated spirits had been cast to earth. Nietzsche was in the midst of things here when the spirits began to roam the earth, while Wagner lived in the spiritual realm after those spirits had already been expelled. Wagner's influence upon Nietzsche after the former's death had an entirely different objective than that of Schopenhauer. This is where the supra-personal but concrete influences begin, not those abstract demonic ones the psychoanalysts speak of. Humanity will have to resolve to enter this concrete spiritual world and to comprehend things that are obvious when the facts are checked. In the future, Nietzsche's biography will be based on the fact that he was inspired by Richard Wagner, who was born in 1813, and who participated in everything that led to the brilliant man whose development up to 1879 I described in my book. Such a biography will also explain that Nietzsche was influenced by Schopenhauer from his 16th year on. When Schopenhauer was involved in the spiritual battle, fought on the spiritual plane before 1879. It will show that Nietzsche was exposed to Wagner's influence after the latter had died and entered the spiritual world, while Nietzsche himself was still here below, where the spirits of darkness were at work. Jung considers this a fact. Nietzsche found a demon and projected it upon Wagner. Oh well, projections, gradients, introvert or extrovert human types... All these are words for abstractions, but they say nothing about realities. These things are truly important. We are not agitating for a world view we have adopted. Rather, everything outside of this world view shows how much present-day humanity needs this view. The end of Lecture 1